Hello, everyone, and welcome. Happy Engineers Week 2023. My name is Alice Rodriguez, and I'm the Deputy Director of External Affairs for the California High Speed Rail Authority. And I'd like to thank you for being with us this afternoon. This year, to celebrate Engineers Week, we've decided to change things up just a bit. Most years, we focus on technical engineering features of our project. Uh, but this year, while still focused on engineering, our discussion is meant to be an introduction to modern high-speed rail station design. The authority currently is designing the first four Central Valley stations in Merced, Fresno, Kings Tulare, and Bakersfield. And today's discussion will focus on sustainability, station features using existing high-speed rail stations as an example, and the nexus of planning, designing, and engineering high-speed rail stations. Uh, we're hoping that at the conclusion of our presentations, uh, we will have some time for Q&A. So get those um, questions um, submitted into the Q&A feature of the Zoom uh, platform. We have three panelists presenting today, and I'd like to introduce them individually as they present. And I'm going to start with Myri, if you want to come online, Myri. Myri Machado is the Sustainability Manager at the Authority. She's worked on the program for over a decade and has over 21 years of experience working in the construction industry. She has an applied math engineering degree from Queens University, specializing in sustainability principles, um, or excuse me, specializing in structural engineering. Her day-to-day -day job involves applying sustainability principles to design and construction projects across a wide range of industries, including buildings and transportation projects. Myri, welcome. Thank you, Alice, very much for that wonderful introduction. And hello, everybody online. We can uh, move right into the first slide, please. So I wanted to just start with um, something big picture here. This is the project vision. And I think uh, most of us know that the California High Speed Rail is quite sustainable. And they've done that very intentionally. The project has big aspirational goals, and it's already started to implement many of them across the program. Our presentation today is going to be focused on the design and construction aspects and those goals, and that's what I'm going to talk through. We won't have time to go into all of the operational goals that the authority is also targeting, but it's good to just keep in mind that they've covered that aspect of sustainability as well. So next slide, please. So as mentioned by Alice, we are going to be focusing on the stations and there are three main focus areas related to the sustainability vision for the station. And that's what I'm going to introduce you to today. The first is enhancing community connections, achieving high performance design criteria, and the third exceeding construction practices. So I'll talk about our key goals in each of those areas. And then I'll hand it back to Alice to introduce our next presenters to give you some more examples of how these goals can be expressed in station design. So next slide, beginning with the high performance criteria. So we're, as mentioned by Alice again, we are beginning the work for designing the first four stations in the Central Valley. So the designers will need to apply several high performance criteria to their design. So the first one I wanna talk about is net positive impact on energy consumption. The stations must be designed to meet the standard. And that means that they will generate 5% more energy than they can use on an annual basis. We've also included requirements for the stations to achieve LEED Platinum certification. This is the highest level of certification in the LEED standard. And furthermore, we've included several mandatory criteria that focus on exceeding performance criteria in the rating system, including water use, energy, and carbon performance requirements. We've also incorporated a requirement to design for and consider future climate conditions and risks and incorporate adaptations related to climate change. We have many items related to environmentally preferable products. So these include requesting environmental product declarations on products used to build and construct the stations. And those are basically like a material ingredient list for a product that cover many sustainable indicators. We also require an embodied carbon life cycle assessment and have mandated a minimum 10% reduction for embodied carbon in the base design of the stations compared to a code building. 
And the final element is to incorporate biophilic design. And I just want to point out the picture in the slide that you can see here is actually an example of our prototype design, which will be um, adapted by the designers. And you can see some of the examples of these high performance design criteria expressed here. So a good thing to point out are the solar panels on the roof. So we anticipate that there's also um, nice opportunities for comfort and views incorporating some of the biophilic elements into the station design as well. So moving on to the next slide. The next aspects, aspect of our station vision is to also not just think about design, but also think about achieving best practices related to construction. So we don't just want to improve design, we want to improve how we build it. So I've highlighted a few of the authorities construction requirements that really go above and beyond industry practice. So the first is achieving net zero greenhouse gas emissions and criteria air pollutants. So we monitor construction emissions associated with all kinds of things, including things like fleet vehicle and construction equipment. In order to achieve net zero, we purchase offsets through the VERA program. So once we know what the emissions are, then what we do is we provide funding for the air district that are impacted by those emissions to purchase less impactful equipment that compensates for the emissions that we can't avoid. But of course, we first want to try to avoid emissions wherever possible. And so that's where mandatory high performance, um, low and zero emission fleet comes in. We mandate tier four equipment whenever possible or zero emission vehicles. So right now with construction equipment, we can't get everything available in electrical form. It's just not available yet on the market for, if you think of some of the big pieces of construction equipment, um, everything from concrete trucks to gigantic diggers um, that might be used to build a building, um, some of those are not yet available. So that's why we mandate um, tier four equipment, which is the best air quality rating. And then over time, we have goals related to zero emission equipment that we'll be implementing. So beginning first right now with 100% on-road light and medium duty construction vehicles is a minimum requirement for 100% electric. And then over time, we will transition heavy duty and off-road equipment. And then finally, we have aggressive waste reduction targets that not only reduce GHG emissions, but also eliminate potentially recyclable and reusable materials from entering the waste stream. So there's a target for 90% overall waste reduction and then 100% of all steel and concrete waste to be diverted from landfill. And next slide, please. So the final aspect of the station vision is community connection. Um, we recognize the significant role that the high-speed rail stations will play in the success of both the system, but also they're the public interface with the system. So they're the nodes that connect our communities. Um, and the communities will be connected better through to each other and through the system if we focus on things like pedestrian oriented accessibility, multimodal access, and these also support other sustainability access um, opportunities such as allowing opportunities for people to take transit easily to site or ride their bicycles. There's also natural features that are to be incorporated into the design of the station and surrounding areas. You can see some examples in the photo, photos here or the images on the slide from our prototypical design. So the idea that we would have walking paths with natural landscapes surrounding station areas. And then even within the station, you can see the design allows for the feeling of being outside, incorporating plants, and having open space for people to connect. And then finally, the stations provide an opportunity for economic catalyst in the surrounding station areas. So when we design the stations, we need to have that goal in mind and build with the idea of that future focused um, economic catalyst idea. And this is a, a good lead into the next section. So that's the quick summary of 
the sustainability visions for the station. And I'm going to hand it back over to you, Alice. Thank you, Mary. It's always fascinating to learn more about what's going to happen at the stations. It gets exciting to think about what um, what those destinations will be uh, for the community, but uh, for the cities themselves and for the travelers that will be using the system. So thank you. Um, stay tuned for questions later. Um, I'd like to go ahead and introduce um, Augustin. Uh, next up, Augustin Ariti is Principal Senior Consultant on Station Planning and Operations with Deutsche Bahn ECO North America and serves as Station Design Lead with our early train operator. Augustin holds two Masters of Science degrees in Engineering and Architecture. For the last 15 years, he's been leading design teams on major rail infrastructure projects, coordinating among multiple discipline engineering designs, focused on transit station design and transit-oriented development on different rail network systems. Augustin, thank you for joining us and take it away. Thanks, Alice. Thanks, Mary, for the intro. Uh, and uh, yes, I'm Agustin Aritzi, and very pleased to be here with you. And I will be walking you through the next slides, introducing you briefly to Berlin Central Station. Um, we've chosen Berlin Central Station as one inspiring representative sample for our soon upcoming California high-speed rail stations. It will operate uh, in this state. Well, Berlin Central works as an integrated transportation hub, which provides customers transit services with full connectivity and accessibility services, sustainable concepts and customer-centric way of operating mobility excellence at rail stations. For a start, maybe some key facts about Berlin Central. It's ranked as number three in Germany for providing mobility services to more than 500,000 passengers and more than 1,000 trains a day. And this plays among the top 10 best European rail stations. To your right, please refer to the attached map where you can see Berlin in pinpointed far <clears throat> to the German eastern border. First requirement for a high-speed rail station is certainly its location and connectivity in the rail network. The scheme shows and here my apologies for the legend still in German language, the strong train service planning concept for the next built out phase 2030 in Germany. Uh, you will identify these big continuous red lines on the map that stand for the high frequency interstate federal rail connecting Berlin to the west on a high frequency corridor with a 30 and 60 minutes headway, meaning providing intercity high-speed rail services by two trains and one train an hour. Next slide, please. While well, zooming in into the station configuration, we quickly figure out Berlin Central is an interchange and crossing station. Operating since 20, 2006, the station still claims to be state-of-the-art facility with good accessibility and a full variety of mobility options to reach your final destination. Berlin Central's intramodality or its capacity to operate different transportation modes simultaneously is a key for providing full accessibility to and from the station. Passengers actively approaching the facility on foot, bikes, scooters, or on bus services may quickly and easily transfer to long distance high speed rail services. See for that the white branded high speed rail train cars at the bottom of the slide and also the red branded regional trains. Within the limits of the metropolitan area, passengers might switch to the, and now switch to the upper right yellow branded Berlin subway and to the upper left red S-Bahn commuter rate rapid transit services. While finally streetcars outside will provide connection with closer place districts at grid. Next slide. Well, I chose these two insights to refer to the customer-centric design of the station. The left image shows the first rider's experience entering the station, easy to move, targeting your platform at a glance, inside a very welcoming train hall configuration with wide spaces, full day light, clear interior conditions, and easy circulation arrangements. To the right, the iBird view shows outside places around the station area, actively contributing to enhance the open public walkable space and surroundings. Operating as an urban hotspot, 
and meeting point for both residents and visitors, interactively linked with pedestrian bridges, leisure and green spaces, as well as built out transit oriented developments in close vicinity. Next slide, please. Focusing on the previous, just some more insights, referring specifically to the main entrance as a first point of contact and service to the customers. To facilitate the smooth transition and circulation through the facility, the station allows for, a, for an in advance information service, both digital and physical. The last one supported by strong visual signage and wi finding systems, inform information displays, ticketing, timetable services, allowing passengers to navigate self-confident across the facility and making clear, easy and quick decisions on the journey. On your way to your train or platform or out of the station towards your final destination, the station opens up to a wide range of services, arranged in different levels, depending on the time availability of passengers. While long distance travelers might take more time, somewhere between 15 and 30 minutes at the station, commuters might be running short of time. The station building allows for different uses, accommodating different shops and services in the right place for the right passenger, which actively contributes to avoid confusion, stress, accidents, and hazards. It definitely enhances mobility in an also sustainable way of saving time and troubles on thousands of passengers a day on their customer journey experience. Next slide, please. Inside spaces like retail, office, and hotel facilities in the main course level show up to customers as soon as their mobility demands have been sorted out. Please note that in terms of room sizing and space programming, the station operational needs cope for half of the total footage while the remaining space is devoted to non-fair revenue activities beyond essential mobility services at the station. Next, please. Well, in this context, it is maybe worth commenting one of the latest success stories about customer experience at Balance Station. The newly implemented initiative provides passengers with private space for resting, learning, or working, or meeting purposes in many ways and situations. Rental spaces available from just minutes long to monthly bookings provide customers and visitors with private, safe, and secure space room for different purposes and alternative productivity areas for work, learning, and business. By the way, this is another way of designing a sustainable environment for customers while reducing travel costs and time for many riders using this kind of facility. Next one, please. Let's have a quick view of the operational heart of the station. Those spaces are not open to the public and are restricted areas. On the right drawings, you will find them etched in yellow and red. While the vertical circulation and platform areas take up the central and most significant open areas depicted in gray color, the technical rooms and operational back of house zones colored in yellow and red are sided and located in the intermediate less accessible areas of the station. As you see from the control desk of the operational station control center, they do monitor many screens and eyes on every area to control operations and ensure safe, secure, and clean performance of the station procedures. Staff members control and operate roughly 24 seven while boarding and lighting is changed and transfer procedures. They also check passenger circulation by visual counting devices in real time to manage crowds from the access to the egress points of the building during operational hours. And there are also many staff members of the ground marshalling the concourse and platform areas, providing support and information to the customers in person. Next one, please. My final comments are focused again on the sustainability of station facilities. Japan is developing an executive program for green transformative stations that ranges from noise reduction, land use, water and waste management, life cycle span of material usage, and enhanced MEP and equipment, recycling methods, energy generation, distribution, and eco design. Berlin Station, even designed 20 years back, has integrated wide roofing areas for PVP solar panels for energy production on alternative not fuel based sources. 
a generous glass ceiling to allow for maximum daylight conditions inside of the facility. Next one. And with that, we are we're done. Thank you very much. I will be happy to respond on questions that might arise through the chat channel. Thank you for your kind attendance. Thanks, Augustine. All right, um, let me go ahead and pull up Frank Fuller if you wanna come online. Frank Fuller is an architect and urban designer practicing as a partner with Urban Field Studio based in the San Francisco Bay Area. His work spans across the United States with a focus on design of sustainable urban environments, including transport station districts, city neighborhoods, and greater downtown areas. He's been working with the Deutsche Bahn team and the California High Speed Rail Authority for the past three years on station planning and urban design of transit-oriented development for six of the California stations. Frank, take it away. Thank you, Alice, and thank you, Augustine. The, um, that station in Berlin is something that we try to emulate in so many different ways. Today, what I'm gonna do is take a, a brief look at the intersection of different disciplines that have helped us in predominantly the conceptual design of the stations along the California high-speed rail. And what I mean by that is that planning, engineering, architecture, landscape architecture have all been a big part of what we've been doing for the last three years. And when you look at the overlapping of the disciplines, what I'm calling it is urban design, because that's where all those three and even four for landscape architecture meet. Next, please. But it's not an easy road and it's not a straight road. A lot of bumps along the way and different changes in direction, but that's the way it is because there are things that come up all the way along the, the line. Uh, and as Myra and Augustine have pointed out, there are many different factors involved in this design process. Next, please. So a lot of what we've been doing is looking at the intersection of the communities they're in, as Myria was talking about, and the issues that need to be solved for making high-speed rail work really well. And so at different stages, which these diagrams try to depict, you can see that there's a lot of collaboration and interplay between what the cities and communities need and what high-speed rail needs. So what we're gonna do is take some information from Fresno and Palmdale, which we've been working on as we go through this presentation to help illustrate some of the points. Next, please. So first, um, as Augustine alluded to, the customer experience is very important. And it's not just when you're in the station, it's when you're going to the station all the way along the, the line. So as you approach here, uh, here's a depiction of Fresno. There's a historical station you can see on the left and in, in the foreground before that, you can see some umbrellas. Well, we've actually been designing a plaza, which we'll look at briefly to be able to get started early before the trains start running. And, and the high-speed rail uh, station includes renovation of that historic depot, which was really important to the city and this historic asset. Here we are walking across to Larry and, and H and there's gonna be a new underpass, which you can see on the left there. Next, please. So who are these people who are gonna use high-speed rail? So what we tried to do is take a look at what we call a customer journeys, which really is about their expectations and experiences. So we did different diagrams and try to imagine who would be using it for different purposes, whether it's commuters or tourists or students or whomever it might be. So different scenarios were depicted and ways of trying to imagine what they would like to see and experience. Next, please. So let's start a little bit with the engineering. So the engineering has been going on for a long time and every step along the way, we were using the engineering information and studies to help us right from the very beginning. Here are those four stations with a red line in between them that Alice mentioned, Merced, Madera, Fresno, Kings Tolari, and Bakersfield. And Madera is not included at this moment, but there are the other four. And so the, just the coordination of the different 
uh, rail, bus, and other modes to how they'd interact with the system was a start. Next, please. And it gets very detailed. This is called schematics, but for the engineering, this is how all the trackage and the system-wide alignment was then depicted and gone over and changed continuously by engineering. Next. And as we were in Palmdale recently, what's very important is all the surveys of what's existing and then looking at where the roadway changes will be and where the tracks are and how you get under, over, and around all the tracks just as a starting point. Here we are in Palmdale. Next. And I love this one. We were working in Fresno and there's an underpass on Tulare Street going underneath the railway, connecting two sides of the station, which is very important because Chinatown's on one side and the traditional downtown is on the other side. And so someone said, well, wait a minute, won't that flood and all these rains we've been recently having? Where's, is there a pump? Oh yes, there's the pump room. So for instance, just, you know, we had put things there and we didn't even know. And so back and forth, back and forth, engineering information together with everything else we're looking at. Next, please. When we jump to architecture, and this is a brief overview, uh, all different scales are looked at. The King's Talari station is in the middle of, of the countryside in agricultural farmland, whereas uh, Fresno and other stations are really in the heart of their downtown. So what are we talking about when we talk about the community and how it fits? This is different, just ways of looking at that and the phasing of it. Next, please. And was mentioned by Myrie, uh, this is a scoring system for LEED. So if you're going to get a platinum, the highest level, here are the criteria they have to use. And I don't expect you to read this, but it involves all manners of things that Myrie touched upon, which really the architect and the architect team has to look at from the beginning of design process. Next, please. So if we look at Fresno, um, just to look at the canopy of the station, the two different sides of the rail from the downtown to the upper left and Chinatown to lower right. One of the things that the architecture challenge to do is to say, well, look, what would happen when, let's say, 10, 20 years after the trains are in operation? There'll be a lot of um, incentives for different kinds of development. What would they be like? What would the city like them to be like? How could they fit? What would we do now that should not preclude something to happen that the city would and the high-speed rail would like to happen? And how do we make sure we've got enough room for all the operations and the expanding and the phasing that the high-speed rail needs? Next, please. So Foster and Partners has been involved with the design of the canopy. And Myri showed you how it has the... the um, solar collectors along the roof. It's also providing shade in the hot valley climate and, and rain protection. So they foster and partners are part of the, they are the lead of the design team now to take the, the station, those four station designs to the next step. Next, please. In doing any work conceptually, it's always good to look at precedents, other places around the world. So we really like the plaza and sort of the shade structure in this station in Graz, Austria. Next, please. And as we looked at them, we thought this bridge configuration with the station in uh, Lorient, France, really was quite well done. A good example. Next, please. And in the United States, the uh, Eastern Brightline route in Florida had a station where the station itself was the bridge in West Palm Beach. And that we also thought was a good example. And it's good to see that the US is really taking in some of these urban uh, station examples that we can use as precedents. Next, please. And here we have three stations in California who are already multimodal hubs for transit just waiting for ice rail to arrive. San Francisco on the left, Union Station in Los Angeles in the center, 
and Arctic in Anaheim on the right. Next, please. So let's turn to planning, because planning really takes so many different factors in all the different forms and looks at it from the early concepts, which is where we've been working, all the way to uh, implementation. And you can see on the lower left there, there's a CVS VTV and phase one. Those Central Valley stations is a CVS and that's what we've been concentrating on. And what's happening there is it's trying to understand as you start with that and its studies, you have to go all the way through many, many different stages and governments and partnerships and arrangements to come up with the plan and the implementation for it. Next. But mainly what we've been concerned about are this joint collaboration with the cities and the communities and the authority. And with the city, in a way, you're looking from the outside in to the station to see what their vision is and how it could happen over time. And for the authority's point of view, we've been looking at the rail infrastructure and all the different operations and functionality and phasing to look from the inside out and hopefully making sure that they meet in a collaborative way over time. Next, please. So here are some of the things that we looked at. The access, the plazas around it, the parking, the districts and the, and the station connections, and certainly the placement of all the station functions. So the word we've been using for this is we're making, in a sense, a framework plan for the stations, and they're, in a sense, co-created by the authority and by the cities. Next, please. So in Palmdale, we recently been conducting uh, workshops with the city and other uh, related agencies. But the city came out with a plan, which is a very broad plan. And it says it really wanted this compact and complete mixed use pedestrian friendly district. And it also wanted a collaborative vision for the area as a vibrant mixed use neighborhood. Well, it's a very large scale area right now. It has lots of space and to make it more compact so it could really be pedestrian oriented and pedestrian friendly is one of our, our tasks for the framework for what the city wants relative to what would happen around the station. Next, please. Here's one of our workshops. We asked three questions along with the, the agencies beneath the picture. Um, really looking at what's the inspiration and the precedence, how can the development character work with what they want it to be, and then to make sure the connectivity and walkability works. Next, please. Since this, that, was, that session was just past COVID, we were doing a hybrid system. So let's turn a minute to Fresno. Fresno is probably the most advanced in the conceptual stage and you can see in this picture that downtown's in the foreground, the circles around the station or the oval. And then beyond that is Chinatown and, and Southwest Fresno. Next, please. And when we zoom in, we see the bridge coming across from the station. The Chinatown side is beyond and the early part, in a sense, the, when the trains first start operating is in the foreground. So there's, <clears throat> there's parking for disabled parking, there's a plaza, there's a bridge stepping down. Both streets on either side of the station have been organized for all kinds of transit uh, intermodal hub. Next, please. And what happened here is that this is based on a plan that was done by the city to look at the district, station district implementation plan which if you look at that square on the diagram on the right, it's about a half mile on the side. So it's within 10 minute or so walkable area. And it's, you know, six blocks across. So it's, it's, a, it's an urban area. And then the picture on the upper left shows that they wanted this to be really a gateway into downtown. This is looking from the station, not to the station. So that's right across the street from that bridge that we showed you next, please. So what do we do? Well, first of all, you have to sort of try out all kinds of things, but this is one of the sketches that came from alternatives to say, um, here is a, 
an early concept sketch, which seemed to capture a lot of what the community wanted. And it also um, started making spaces that could be realized over time without precluding much. Next. So this is a diagram that came out of that, which says, what would the station area look like the first day the trains start operating? As you can see, lots of surface parking, some plaza spaces. Um, none of the existing buildings are really touched much around the station and around all that has the trees in it. Next, please. And then if you jump way ahead by 10, 20 years, you say, well, what could that development be like around it? What's the transit oriented development that's possible? And then how would that parking evolve over time and the different transit pick up some of that and parking within the development some at all that evolution as best we could predict it now, which of course we can't really predict uh, very well, but we try. Next, please. And so when you look at it again, imagining just within their existing height limits and who knows what height limits there might be or what configurations of buildings there could be, you can see that it could be quite developed in a quite urban type station. Next, please. And then it's important to look at what could happen before the trains run because the trains are predicted to run in 2029 or 2030. And so there's a lot to go before then. So we looked at, with high-speed rail, an area that could have early activation, as we call it, a plaza, in addition to the historic depot. Now, the historic depot, which you can see on the bottom there, is being renovated. The plans are being drawn up now, and it will be renovated. And then the plaza was right in front of it and won't really get in the way of any construction that's being done, except for maybe the depot itself. So it could all be done. Uh, in a synchronized manner. Next, please. And so what we did is then say, okay, we can zone this, we can phase it. And we zoned it so that there's an area in front of the depot. And then there's a really a big zone two Oasis Park for performances. And then there's certainly the H Street interface, which is where all that the transit interconnections are, which would be done with the city. And then later probably zone three nearer to where the bridge will be. So that is a way that we could get things going and work within the city's park and street system and their event schedules. Next, please. And the historic station you can see on the left, that's about 1890 when it was built. And on the right, you can see there used to be a park right in front of the historic station and with the Chamber of Commerce building in it. It was a transit hub in its own right. And because these street cars used to go in front of the station, so what we're doing in a sense is uh, reinstituting a park in the transit hub system. Next, please. And precedents are needed for this too. When we heard from the community, when we had several workshops with events in downtown Fresno and, and in Chinatown, they said shade. One of the big things, we need shade. It is really hot here in the summer, which we witnessed. Next, please and water. We need, whether it's mists, fountains, uh, sound, uh, still water, water is always very welcome and needed. Uh, and we might have to use the least of it if it's a mister system in order to accommodate our drought, of course. Next, please. And so here's a rendering of uh, H Street with its different uh, transit connections. And you can see the interim plaza in the background beyond the, the portal of the bridge coming across the tracks, gives you a, a, a slight feel from an aerial view of what could be. And you can see some parking, interim parking in the right bottom part of the picture. Next, please. So thank you very much. I look forward to questions and discussion. Thanks, Frank. Um, amazing. Love all those renderings, just to get the idea of being able to see what a station might look like. It's very exciting stuff. Um, so uh, for now, I'm going to actually 
um, change it up a little bit and have my colleague, Brittany Ortiz, come online. Brittany is an executive fellow serving her fellowship year here um, at the California High Speed Rail Authority. She works in the strategic communications and also alongside the sustainability and planning team. Um, and so she's going to ask a question of our panelists, um, each of them individually. So um, Brittany, take it away. Yeah, thank you so much, um, everyone, for your wonderful presentation. I just have three questions for each of you, beginning with Myri. Uh, Myri, I know you touched a little bit on creating a biophilic design for high-speed rail stations. Can you just describe some of the benefits of having this natural or biophilic design and how it relates to climate resiliency? Sure, yeah. There, I mean, I think there's a, a lot of different benefits to biophilic design, so maybe I'll just start broad. Um, it's been shown to have a positive impact on human health and well-being, so it gives a uh, connection to nature, and ways that you can incorporate that is everything from using natural surfaces and materials in the design, as well as providing views uh, to the outside outdoors to provide that connection so that you're not completely enclosed without that aspect. But then on the climate resiliency side, um, you can use natural features that can help um, manage aspects um, related to climate resiliency. So there are ways to integrate natural um, rain, water management systems, for example, that would provide also a biophilic connection, but at the same time, incorporate the idea and make the stations more resilient. So uh, providing spaces for water to go, even though it does happen rarely, when it does um, can rainwater, for example, it can um, overload systems if it comes, especially with more intensity that current storm rainwater storms are expected to arrive with. So by providing natural features that allow space for that to happen, you provide the biophilic connection within the design, but you also make the station more climate resilient and robust to climate change. Thank you so much for sharing that. Mm -hmm. As a non-expert, it's really interesting to see how these natural features kind of play into that design. Um, so thank you. And then Augustine, my next question is for you. Um, you discuss many features in the Berlin station that make it really unique, including open space, workspaces, and different transportation modes. So I was just wondering, what are the I guess you discussed a lot of them, but what are the major or key features of the Berlin station that have inspired the station design features for um, the California high-speed rail that are maybe not as prevalent in most traditional US rail systems? Oh, thank you, Brittany, for the question. And um, try to be uh, short on the answer. <laughs> Uh, I guess uh, uh, when it comes to uh, understanding what makes a station really uh, fit for purpose, you have to concentrate on the operational needs. So we have a, a design criteria how to operate the station in order to make it really relevant for the purpose of the journeys of, the, of your riders and customers. So even if the station really, is, it's not, so it's not so much about copy and paste, it's actually not that, because uh, you will fail dramatically when you try to do this, because it's not fitting in the climate, as uh, Mary uh, already said, or it's not fitting in the way how you design and how the population is here expecting your, your service. But one thing which is definitely universal is when it comes to rail station, how uh, the operational uh, the services are performed. And this is something that is captured in KPIs, in key performance indicators. So when it comes to uh, punctuality and safety and time uh, integration between the different modes, this is something that is already invented. So it's no, no need to invent again or reinvent the wheel. So you have a, a clear understanding how a station needs to be operated, what are the key performance indicators, what are the elements that need to be placed, even if the ridership is different, if the climate is different, if you are a respected persona who will run the, uh, as customers, your service will different, 
there are certain elements. Uh, and, and this is what I will highlight in, in, in front of, of the audience today, which are the, the main keys that needs uh, for us to be cons uh, considered in our station design. So we are trying to ensure that the station design, which is unique for the new stations as we have seen, seen this in the wonderful presentation from Frank, endures and uh, 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 allows uh, 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 for, for, for the operational excellence, even if it doesn't seem to be that similar to other stations, it doesn't need to be. It's just the operational uh, elements that are there, mainly the technical back of house, which cannot really be seen so much for, from, from the public and from the uh, front uh, side of the station, that make really the difference. The integration with the rolling stock, integration with the timetables, integration with the different other um, service providers like the bus services at the station. So the people really have a smooth transition from one mode to another, this kind of elements and all what is needed so that the bus customer feels really safe, secure, easy, makes good decisions and uh, his journey experience is really uh, outstanding. This, this is kind of a catalog of elements that are captured that we have with us and that we are ensuring together with the station designers that they are captured and, 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 and well noticed in the design so that the station, when it comes to operation, is fit for purpose and uh, performs uh, as uh, we want it. Uh, uh, first class of, of services for, for the Californians. Thank you. Thank you so much for that explanation and kind of just painting how uh, the customer or the um, user is at the center of everything that goes into the design. So thank you for that. And then Frank, uh, last but not least, uh, my last question is for you. And you did a great job in explaining kind of like the interface between the elements that go into the station design. And it sounds like there's a ton of collaboration that goes into this urban uh, station design. So I was just kind of wondering what are some of, I mean, there's probably a lot, but if you can uh, just kind of touch on some of the key challenges related to the interface of engineering, architecture and planning when it comes to building uh, first in the nation, high-speed rail stations. And are these challenges different than um, traditional rail stations in the U.S. Well, the uh, the collaboration, as you say, is quite a, a, a large task. And since there's no, there really are no high speed rail stations built in the United States, um, we have to look elsewhere and have expertise, like with Deutsche Bahn and and Augustine and his team, which is very helpful. Uh, and we have to assemble a large team from all different disciplines. Really, I just focused on four. Let's talk about some of the big challenges. Well, one of the biggest challenges that <clears throat> I focused on and, and done some research in the past is, is how does a station like this fit within whatever fabric of urbanity it's trying to fit within? And, and that's a huge one because if you look at the Chinese examples, a lot of them are huge. It's not 500,000 or so people, it's many, many, many more. And so you'll see that the station looks like an airport within the city. In other words, vast amounts of territory where what we've been trying to do is emulate stations where they really fit. For us to even talk about the fact that we want pedestrian friendly next to something that goes 240 miles an hour and comes into the station. Some of them just go through and some of them stop. That's a huge challenge because we, it's a massive technological uh, exercise. At the same time, you're trying to make a livable, urban, compact environment, as you saw in the, say, the Palmdale mission statement. And that's something that's um, really going to make it work or not. Because if, to me, we make it like an airport, and security is like an airport and all the tr trouble of getting from and back from the airport to wherever you really want to go instead of to downtowns, that's a huge challenge. And so what we've been trying to do in the conceptual design 
and you saw that in some of the renderings of Fresno, is make it compact, make the experience really something you want to experience. Because when we're looking at the customer journey, the, the other customer journey that people make is, and I won't go too much longer on this answer, is to go uh, to their garage, get in their car and drive. Why wouldn't you do that? And then you, if you're driving to LA, for instance, from San Francisco, you stop at Kettleman City, where Tesla has built a nice, big, comfortable charging station with all sorts of amenities. And then you keep going on your way if you still need that. Why wouldn't you do that? Well, there are a lot of reasons why not. But one of the key reasons is to make sure the journey is really fun and comfortable and convenient and can accommodate a lot of our needs. Thank you so much for that explanation. And then I will hand it back to Alice, our facilitator. Thank you, Brittany, great questions. <laughs> okay, um, so one of the things that come through the Q&A, um, and so I'm gonna kind of um, synthesize it just a little bit, because I what I think the question is getting at is kind of these the elements, like how, how will you know you're at a high-speed rail station? What design elements, each station is so unique um, given what you were talking about, Frank, about you know working with each individual city and what their their what their needs are and what they would like to have, um, but also knowing that we have these foundational kind of goals around sustainability. Myri, looking at you, what are some of the design elements that will make you know you are at a high speed rail station? At, at least let's just focus on those four Central Valley stations. We don't have to go beyond that. Who who'd like to to take a stab at that? I'll take a stab. You know, it's very interesting that. Um, the High Speed Rail Authority um, asked Foster and Partners to design a canopy system for all the stations that weren't the ones that were already well underway, like San Francisco, LA, and Anaheim. So the prototypes were for stations that are above ground, stations that are at the ground. And so there, there were very much, there's a lot of similarities. So if you looked at that, that became sort of an iconic element uh, for all the stations in the first round of those did look sort of prototypical. Well, what happened then, and you can start to see it in Fresno, as, and this is something that Augustine referred to, you can't just sort of apply something. As they started being developed, um, each one, and certainly Fresno, took on all sorts of character because what Chinatown wanted versus what the downtown wanted and how the bridge comes over and how, how would it be welcoming to this nice street, Mariposa Street, which leads you right into downtown Fresno, means that what you were seeing in those renderings were how even that system was being modified to be unique to the place. And still, when you look at it, the scale of it is big and the scale and, and the it's quite modern. And so you look at it and you think, oh, well, they kept the historic station. That's really nice in Fresno, but boy, this is really different. And I think that's going to be true all the way along the line. There's going to be some um, uh, measure of very new with the old and hopefully harmonizing them both in the new station configurations. Love it. And Mario, do you want to mind, do you mind taking that question also from a sustainability point of view? Sure, yeah. And I, I think there will be elements of the station design because of the goals that I, I highlighted at the beginning that will have a common feel to them. And the prototype station that Frank mentioned, the intent is to use that as a basis to begin the design. But of course, it's going to be informed by all these locations specific and incorporated into that prototype were the sustainability goals. So that's why you see things like the solar panels on the roof that would be indicative of a net positive station. So I think um, elements like that will come through visually when you're interacting with the stations. I think that idea of open space around them, um, especially in particular for the Central Valley stations, I know that that is a goal to have that aspect. So um, as we said, we're early stages in design right now. I mean, we're really just starting to engage with the designer. So there's a lot that will evolve through that process, but some of those common goals will start to provide a bit of a, 
a feel and a sense of place of each of these stations that connect not just to local community, but some of those bigger pictures. We already talked about biophilia a few times, but having that incorporated, um, they are designed to be open air platforms um, that do have the canopy because of course we want that for comfort for users that for the people that are, are waiting to take the train so there will be some common elements that way i love it thank you thank you so much all right augustine i'm going to point this question towards you and um i did have the opportunity and the good fortune to visit the berlin central station myself once to a few years back uh, 2019, I believe it was, and really experienced the marvel that that station is. And this person is asking, um, similar to how train stations across the globe have shops and restaurants within the station, what plans does California have to host attractive commerce and restaurants within the stations? Uh, sure. Um, you might take for a, for, for a start the idea of uh, implementing all the services at once, which is not the case, not even in Berlin, not even in, in other cities or stations. So it's a, a very uh, transformative and uh, and step-by-step and -step process. You start with the essentials or basics of the service, which basically is related to the platform and all what is the passengers exchange at platform edge, boarding, alighting, the trains and done providing the services for transferring the tra passengers to another transportation mode. And step by step, you're providing ac according to surveys, according to um, mm, testing uh, what the, the clients really need for that purpose. You add from day to day, from year to year, additional services add, add, uh, so that you at the end come up with a full package of services, which is convenient for the public, convenient for the riders and wish and desire is um, and comfortably uh, used and, and, and attended. Otherwise, it will be a flaw uh, and a, a, a bad investment if you start with services which are not required or not, not uh, um, uh, accepted by, by the public. So it will be a, a, a process which uh, transforms the station from year to year Consider that a station like uh, Berlin operates already since almost 20 years, and and uh, we are uh, far from that moment of operational day one, when the station was basically built but uh, empty in terms of services beyond the basic uh, essentials. So the added services, which are not in the track site area, but in the land site area where the people wait, where the people have uh, the amenities. And uh, so they come uh, uh, little by little, step by step, whenever uh, the business case for that uh, appears to be uh, the right time for. Thank you. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, and you know, actually, as you're answering that, it made me think to go back to you, Frank. Um, and this will have to be our last question because I know we've got about two minutes left. but. Um, you talked a little bit about early site activation. So Augustin is talking a little bit more about, you know, once the station comes online and it's working and then it develops, uh, you know, around there and services, but let's go pre that. What, what is, why is that important? Why is that early site activation needed? Um, in how is that, um, how is that um, uh, 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 delivered? I mean, like, you know, like, is it by the city? Is it by us? Is it, who, who is it that kind of decides what happens there? Well, there's a lot of pieces to that answer, but let me just say that in Fresno's case, uh, the, the authority owns the land for that plaza, but the city has all kinds of events that they put out on both sides of the station, and they're not far away. Matter of fact, there's a baseball park right there next to Chauncey Park, and so which has events in it. So there are a lot of places where it could overlap with city events or be a part of city events. So in that way, the city be could be responsible in partnership for the events, whereas the authority is going to be responsible for also uh, getting it implemented in terms of construction. Although H Street, which is right there, is going to be a largely a city project. So there's a lot of interplay to answer that. Why get it going early? Yeah. Well, because the um, the whole area needs to be owned by the community. In other words, it, the, the, need, the community needs to be invested in its success from the beginning. 
And you could see from the ones we went to, we went to uh, a Friday night at, in Chinatown. We went to an art hop uh, on the downtown side. This, the downtown, like many downtowns in this case, is really coming to fruition. A lot of uh, new things are happening. This is tied together with their park system, with their event system, with their street system. It's the public realm. And so that's why it needs to be incorporated so that right from the beginning, the customer journey, the customer experience happens even before rail comes along. Now, one more piece. This is also an opportunity, which a lot of the German stations did and others, to have information about what's coming. So this information about what we're talking about, this design, it's information what the station could look like. It's information when all of a sudden they're testing the trains. Come down and take a look. They're testing. They're not running yet, but they're here they go. So get people there. And then finally, it's, oh, look, it's all integrated with the station itself. Oh, you get me so excited. I can't wait for the day. <laughs> <laughs> well, I do. Uh, we do have to wrap up. It's uh, at the top of the hour now. I want to say thanks to Mari, uh, to Augustine, to Frank. I thank you to the viewers out there who watched us um, and uh, enjoyed the conversation. And thank you for all of your great questions. Um, we'll see you in the next one. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> bye bye. Thanks, everyone. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye.